Um, my, my name is Joe Rowan, and I will be your host this morning. And uh, we've got a great program lined up for us today. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, but I uh, want to just do a couple of quick things, uh, just as um, kind of housekeeping. I'm sure most of you are all familiar with how Zoom works these days. But uh, if you have a question, and we will have uh, be taking questions from the audience. So if you do have a question or a comment that you want to interject, if you would, please use the... Uh, uh, the raise hand feature, which is under reactions at the bottom of your screen. So if you just raise your hand, uh, that'll put you in the queue that we can uh, be monitoring. Um, as well, if you have comments that you want to add, uh, you know, feel free to use the chat button. Uh, you can direct the chats at uh, anyone in particular or to, to us as the host, and we'll uh, make sure we get that addressed. Um, and then, uh, again, it, we will be running to uh, 1130. And uh, and again, we'll be uh, offering you or giving you the opportunity to ask questions as we go along. Before we get started, before I inter introduce our, our panelists uh, for this morning, I want to just uh, take a quick moment, point out for those of you who aren't familiar, NOCO Housing Now is a volunteer organization uh, that uh, uh, encompassing all of Northern Colorado, so uh, Larimer, Weld, uh, Boulder counties. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to bring information to the communities, but as well, um, it's, a, it's a, a portal for you to uh, access some of the resources that are being created. And uh, we'll have our screen, uh, excuse me, our opening screen put back up here in just a second, and you'll see uh, where the URL, the web address for NOCO Housing Now, um, where you can access recordings of these meetings as well as see past meetings as well as additional material. So uh, we want to make that resource available to you as you need it. Uh, one other quick housekeeping item. I want to uh, call attention to the fact that uh, there will be a, um, a developer's toolkit uh, that will uh, be taking place April 13th and 14th. If uh, those of you who aren't familiar, uh, the Colorado Division of Housing uh, puts on these uh, semi-regular uh, sessions where folks that uh, maybe are you're you're talking to or you yourself um, want to really try to address some of this housing issues. The first question that usually comes up is, "How do I even get started? What are the resources? Uh, what do I need to know?" And so these developer toolkits uh, that are put on. Uh, they bring in experts that will help you to actually identify what resources are available. And so we'll get that into the chat here uh, uh, for a link to that, uh, that you'll be able to access that. But it is through the Colorado Division of Housing. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our panelists today. And oh, by the way, um, also thank our sponsors that, um, uh, Mary, if you wouldn't mind putting that um, that opening a page up again so folks can uh, see all of our sponsors uh, for, for our events. Um, but uh, we are very thrilled to have Brian Rosberg, who is the executive director of the uh, Housing Colorado, which is a statewide um, organization that, that represents uh, housing providers, uh, developers that are engaged in this space. And then we also have Jonathan Capelli, who is the uh, executive director for the uh, Neighborhood Development Collaborative. And he'll, uh, Brian is going to focus on some of the legislation that was uh, making its way through the House. Obviously, uh, a big bill just landed the other day. Um, and then uh, Jonathan is going to help, uh, really help us uh, discuss how we how we discuss policy among our uh, our constituents. Uh, very complex. Housing tends to be a very complex issue and uh, uh, very, very passion, uh, very, uh, very much a passionate issue for a lot of folks. And sometimes it's, it can be really difficult to make those connections and how we interpret uh, policy and, and, uh, and, and again, develop that policy, but then as well, how do we interpret it once it's developed? So with that, um, Brian, I'm going to ask you to, to get us kicked off here and uh, just walk us through what's, what has been introduced into uh, into the legislature, what's made its way through, and what we're still working on. So, Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure. Thanks, Joe. And, and thanks so much for having me today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all, um, to take part in uh, these conversations around the state. Um, 
just so you all know, Housing Colorado's vision is that every Coloradan has a safe, healthy, quality, affordable home in a thriving community. That's kind of our, our North Star in the work that we do. We are the industry association for the affordable housing industry statewide. So we represent over 300 member organizations from developers and contractors to architects and frontline service providers. And we do uh, um, two kind of big things. One, we advocate on behalf of the industry and um, mostly at the state level, um, we do some federal advocacy and um, we have a, a housing advocacy manager who's working to enable local housing advocates to do their jobs um, more, effect more effectively and more efficiently. And so um, you'll probably be hearing from Allie more and more in the future um, as needs come up um, in Northern Colorado. The other thing we do is we educate mm -hmm. the industry um, on kind of cutting, re cutting edge topics. And so we do that um, through webinars and forums, but also through our conference, which is held in October every year up in the mountains. So um, those are that's kind of who we are as Housing Colorado. Um, in terms of advocacy and um, the legislature this year, I, I think um, I took a look at our bill tracker this morning and um, we have over 20 bills uh, that we're tracking um, this session, um, whether uh, we're taking a position on those or not. Um, but that's, that's a significant amount of uh, pieces of legislation. And coming off of the last couple of years where we had one-time federal dollars to spend, um, you may have heard about the um, ARPA money that uh, the legislature dedicated to affordable housing. This year is an interesting year in that um, Prop 123 passed in the fall. And we're thinking about um, kind of longer range how to prioritize spending of um, those resources that are going to be dedicated to affordable housing, close to $300 million a year. So, um, you know, we've come off a couple of years where we were thinking kind of short term, um, how do we spend one time dollars to now thinking about um, how do we spend some longer term money with a longer time horizon. In, in the midst of those conversations, um, there's also been, uh, a lot of work that's kind of um, coming to fruition now in, in a, a, a few areas related to affordable housing and related to housing in general. Um, I think I was, I was thinking about the bills that have been coming forward this year and trying to think if there was uh, two or three kind of big themes to the, to the legislation that's coming. I think one is definitely around tenants' rights. Um, Another topic that is coming up is giving more um, power to local governments um, to, to do things related to housing. And then sort of uh, conversely, um, as of Wednesday, and this has been a conversation that's been happening, um, preempting local government. So there's kind of this tension <laughs> at the legislature uh, around um, local government mm -hmm. regulation and control of um, decision-making around affordable housing and around housing in general. And so um, in terms of kind of some of the, the, the big bills that, that we've seen this year in the tenants' rights realm, um, there's a bill on um, rent control, um, giving power. This is one of those um, kind of, this sort of bridges two categories but is uh, giving power back to local governments to, um, to initiate uh, local rent control policies. Currently, there's a state ban on uh, rent control. And this bill, uh, House Bill 1115, would give power back to the local governments to initiate um, their own uh, local rent control ordinances. Um, it's gone through uh, some some dramatic changes um, from its first introduction. Um, I can kind of talk about some other bills as well. Um, in the tenants' rights um, arena, there is a bill on prohibiting um, some uh, uh, some components of lease agreements that um, have advantaged landlords in the landlord-tenant relationship. Um, that's House Bill 1095. There is, um, there was a, there is a bill on pet ownership and housing. There's a 
bill um, for just cause eviction. So there's a, a lot of legislation um, trying to, um, I don't know if equalize out, but give more rights to tenants um, in, in that landlord tenant relationship. Um, so um, this is kind of continuing off a trend for the last few years. And so um, we've seen a lot of bills in that, that general direction. Um, in terms of giving some control and power back to local governments, as I mentioned, um, the rent control bill is one of those. There's also um, House Bill 1190, which is the right of first refusal bill. This would um, allow uh, local governments to um, have the, the first right of refusal if a multifamily um, development uh, or project goes up for sale. Um, and there's affordability requirements in there. Um, and then in terms of uh, perhaps, uh, I guess we call it preemption of local control. Um, on Wednesday, this is, I don't know if you can see how thick this is, 105 page bill was introduced, uh, Senate Bill 231, which is we've known has been coming. The governor was pretty clear in his state of the state and in his campaign that he wanted to, uh, that housing is a matter of statewide concern. And he wanted to do something about um, some of the barriers that development has faced um, in, in local communities. And so um, he's introduced, he uh, helped, the governor's office helped write, um, Senate Min Majority Leader Dominic Moreno is carrying this bill along with representatives Woodrow and Judah. And, um, I can get into, you know, it's a, it's a very large bill, but um, in a lot of, some of the highlights are that it will require state, regional and local housing needs assessments and housing needs plans to be developed. It will um, preempt local uh, zoning regulations around single family zoning to allow for up zoning, um, allow duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes in certain areas of the state it would allow accessory dwelling units by right um, around the state. Uh, it would, um, it has provisions in there around transit uh, oriented development and transit corridors um, and what can be done uh, within certain, uh, certain radiuses of uh, transit stops or, or transit corridors in terms of what kind of housing can be built. Um, it has uh, it streamlined some uh, other barriers uh, to housing development, and then it does some. And I haven't honestly read all the way to the end of the bill yet. Um, I have tried my best, um, but I <laughs> sleep. Cool. Um, so uh, there's there's provisions around water usage and um, and growth um, that goes along with this. So. Lots of bills. Um, I see, Joe, you're trying to get in here. So um, well, I, was, in. I, I was just going to uh, interject real quick. So I did put a, a link in the chat um, to SB 213, which is the land use bill. For those of you who, who, who do want to read all 106 <laughs> pages. And you can, you know, the legislative de declaration and definitions section, I think, is 21 of those 106 pages. So very <laughs> interesting. Um, uh, so that bill will um, start its journey through um, the legislature. Um, there's, it's certainly not a, a perfect piece of legislation, um, although the, the governor touted, you know, they've had over 100 stakeholder meetings about this. Um, they had a press conference on Wednesday that Jonathan spoke at, along with local elected officials um, and business folk and environmental folk. Um, kind of touting the the, the um, aspects of this bill. So um, there's a lot going on at the legislature. I'm happy to answer questions um, on particular bills, but like I mentioned, um, you know, we've, we're tracking over 20 bills, which is um, kind of a high for us um, as Housing Colorado. Um, we're we're working to take as many positions as we can. Um, a lot of bills. Um, a lot of things this year in the affordable housing realm, I, I guess a, another theme is that 
we've been hit a little sideways with some things. Like for instance, the pet ownership bill I mentioned um, wanted to legislate the qualified allocation plan that um, Colorado Housing and Finance Authority uses to um, make determinations on projects that, that get um, the low income housing tax credit equity financing. And um, less on a policy note, but more on a precedent note, um, the affordable housing community kind of had to stand up and, and raise our hands and say, we'd like to amend this piece of legislation. But there's there's kind of been some things that have hit us a little sideways um, and, and just trying to make sure that, um, you know, big A affordable housing is protected in some of these measures um, as, as they progress through the legislative process. So um, lots going on, um, but happy to answer any questions um, after maybe after Jonathan kind of talks a little bit about what he's been up to. Um, and, and I'd like to say that Jonathan and I and some others work very closely together. Jonathan's actually a board member of mine at Housing Colorado. Um, and uh, we, we, work, we try to work pretty seamlessly among um, a number of organizations who have interests in affordable housing to, to best represent um, the, in, the, inter, the interests of the industry, um, as well as uh, local communities who are trying to develop affordable housing. Great. Well, thanks, Ryan. Uh, so yes, uh, once again, if anybody does have questions, feel free to um, use the raise hand feature and we'll call you up. But uh, Brian, if you could just real quick, um, have any of the bills that have been introduced relative to housing, have any of them actually made it through um, the both houses of the of the legislature? Not yet. Um, <clears throat> uh, a couple have made it through the, the, the House of Origin, the, the Chamber of Origin um, already. Um, some are stacked up um, in um, the Appropriations Committee because the budget process has to take place before um, bills with fiscal notes can can move forward. Um, so, you know, there this is a, t a typical thing that happens during the legislative session is bills pass through committee, their, their first committee, um, and then get put in a queue in the Appropriations Committee until after the budget um, goes through, which will happen in the next couple of weeks. So nothing, um, and, and a few bills have kind of stalled in the second chamber um, because they're still dealing with their own bills. Um, but uh, I can, I, I don't believe anything's gone all the way through yet. Okay. Um, Thank you. I know the ones that we're tracking haven't. And um, I believe this is something that uh, folks can find for themselves if they go to the Housing Colorado website. Uh, you you have a bill tracker mm -hmm. on the I can on your the, website. I can put the link uh, to that in the chat. Great, thank you. Well, while you're doing that, uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Jonathan Compelli is with the uh, uh, Neighborhood Development Collaborative, and uh, Jonathan, I'm going to let you describe for the for the our guests or participants today uh, what exactly the Neighborhood Development uh, Collaborative does. Uh, and and how you interact with uh, both uh, on the policy, the public policy side, as well as um, uh, working with neighborhood groups that um, that are looking to again revitalize uh, neighborhoods as well as providing housing for uh, uh, for our community. So, Jonathan, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Lacho. Um, nice to see and meet everyone. Um, uh, let's see. So um, our uh, neighbor developments uh, collaborative's mission is um, exactly opposite of Brian's at Housing Colorado. We're diametrically opposed, just kidding. Uh, very, very similar. Um, uh, um, the, the differences, I guess, are that my group is, is a coalition of just um, uh, nonprofit or mission-based uh, housing providers only in the metro, um, in the metro area, essentially. Um, and uh, the group sort of came together originally uh, back in the day during um, uh, the foreclosure crisis where some nonprofits kind of banded together to figure out how sort of each according to their ability, they could do different interventions uh, to prevent foreclosures. Um, so whether it's doing rehab or um, housing counseling, or if a property already been foreclosed, buying it and then um, uh, selling or renting it to a low-income housing provider or a low-income person. Um, et cetera. So there was this um, 
this coordination um, on, on a programmatic side. Um, that kind of turned into um, as federal dollars um, sort of um, uh, started declining, um, as you have probably all experienced, like a lot of HUD dollars got slashed in the in the mid 2000 teens. Um, uh, there was a desire to um, advocate at the at the local sort of municipal level to get cities to start to stand up their own funds, and then we've seen cities across the state start to do that, implement their own policies, and rely less on on federal dollars. I'm not saying that we wouldn't also want federal dollars, but um, that was just a, that, the dynamic at the time. Um, and uh, and then in more recent years, it's uh, especially over COVID, it's turned into uh, a, a need to focus our attention at the state level as well. And so we're really thankful for the partnership with Housing Colorado to sort of help elevate that voice of of, um, of nonprofit practitioners. Um, you know how not only do we how do we increase funding, um, but how do the programs need to be shaped. Uh, and and administered so that they can actually roll out and be uh, useful um, on the ground. Um, uh, so that's kind of uh, uh, where we go there. Um, I would say uh, just one more addition to Brian's comprehensive overview of all the different policies. I don't think you mentioned this was um, is the right of first refusal bill. Um, and so that's just a, as another big one. I would say you have Prop One Two Three. Land use reform. Some of you might have been in the in the uh, the meeting this morning on land use potentially, um, but there was a, there was one for um, kind of municipalities. Um, I kind of squeezed my way in there. It was a fascinating conversation. And then um, right first refusal, um, which is uh, that governments. Um, and I just want to make sure I didn't. Did you already say this, Brian? Or am I just forgetting? You did. Well, never mind. Then I won't go into my <laughs> office. God, it's Friday, guys. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> So um, uh, yeah, so that, that's essentially us. I think a lot of my uh, of my section uh, or yeah will kind of maybe um, be better suited to sort of sort of questions potentially for how we how you were thinking about um, talking about housing amongst your constituents and things like that. Um, uh, I will just say that um, there's definitely um, a, a narrative, you know, sort of I don't want to say war that sounds too apocalyptic or. Um, but uh, about what, you know, um, who needs housing, who's in need, um, uh, why they're in need, um, whose fault it is, whose responsibility is to do anything about it, um, where it should be placed. Um, all those sort of dynamics play out in a way that makes it very difficult to pull off developments um, uh, at the right AMI, the right income levels um, in, the, in the correct areas. Um, I think I've noticed over the years, I mean, everyone has experienced NIMBY, so I don't really need to probably go into that. Um, but as uh, housing uh, prices have increased, um, folks who traditionally, historically, weren't impacted by, um, by housing pressures, right, um, are suddenly being impacted. Uh, and so for some legislators, that makes it appear like we have a new housing crisis um, that didn't exist before. Um, uh, that is really, you know, crippling the middle class. So you'll also see another theme in both this year's um, legislat uh, legislature and also last year's is this hyper focus on middle income housing. Um, obviously, super important, um, but not at the expense of folks that um, have had extremely high needs this entire time. Um, you'll even hear some folks talk about how they only have needs at this middle income area. Um, and they might and they'll define middle income as high as 200% of the median income. So there's there's a lot of um, debate about how to exactly where to target affordability in any given bill. Um, and again, whose responsibility for it. the other dynamic is um, and you probably for those of you who are, um, uh, represent our working government. Um, uh, we have a state that is um, sort of a. Uh, um, uh, with with the strong uh, local control um, sort of culture, um, sure we're a state, but we're also lots of little principalities, and each principality um, thinks about their housing needs um, uh, often in a silo, despite the fact that the dynamics play out in such a way that in some cases sixty percent of the workforce might be driving in from somewhere else, right? And so if you're thinking about your housing needs and you're thinking simply about your immediate city, you're going to say there's going to be lots of middle income housing issues. Um, and that will be true, um, but you won't necessarily take into account the effect of that housing on, or, uh, of the lack of housing on the region. 
Um, is the worker who's driving in part of your community? Is there a responsibility to build housing or uh, be inclusive when you think about housing policies for them? If so, to what degree should that be? Um, all those things um, sort of feed into a cauldron of um, of uh, scent. I don't know. Uh, that 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 um, that just makes a lot of debate. I'm glad we're having the debate. It's um, and it's coinciding with probably the most transformative um, uh, legislative last two years in the when it comes to housing in the history of the state. So it makes sense that this would all kind of foment and bubble together now. Um, but it's uh, it's very um, very interesting. Um, I know you wanted me to talk maybe about community, but um, I don't know if we want to move to questions and we can talk about more than that. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Well, yeah, so I'll, I'll get started. Obviously, we've got a quiet group here this morning, but uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll we'll see some questions pop up. Uh, but maybe just to uh, take what you were just discussing uh, a little bit further, and that is, you know, how uh, do you have some techniques that you can share with us or uh, thoughts on on how we have that policy discussion, not just with the policymakers, but also with our own stakeholders to reconcile some of those um I guess, uh, misperceptions of, uh, sometimes they're misperceptions, sometimes it's just a plain blind spot. Um, sometimes it, it really is, uh, it takes on more of an emotional um, dynamic to it. But it, it, are there techniques that you can share with us to have that uh, deeper conversation with our stakeholders to, uh, to help them understand if we, if we do uh, enact one type of policy, how does that impact other things that we're trying to do in our community? And, um, and I think, you know, the, the rent control issue to me is a perfect example of that where, uh, yeah, we want some of that local control to develop these policies, but at the same time, does that also not um, discourage uh, more supply that what that we're actually missing right now? And so, you know, it, it, Talk us through a little bit about how you reconcile those um, those different dynamics, if you could. Um, okay, well, with with, uh, with rent control or or similar um, policies that will um, sort of um, yield a certain response, either really negative, really ne or really positively, like rent control. Um, it, I think it's just important to talk about. Um, uh, is nuance, which is very difficult sometimes to communicate in little sound bites to constituents or to policymakers or, or anyone. But um, uh, someone asked me the other day if I, if, I, if I thought rent control worked, and it's like, well, I don't know, maybe a good example is, do I think that speed limits and traffic control works? It's like, what's your definition of works, and how many different types of controls can you have under that just like one category? So, you know, um, this rent control bill, for instance, um, uh, also isn't perfect, but it ties uh, itself to um, uh, its inflation plus, I believe, three percent. Um, and uh, there probably could be some more flexibility in it. Um, but there are there are jurisdictions in other parts of the country that have rent control fixed at, you know, I think St. Paul has a two or three percent. So it doesn't take into account like CPI or inflation or anything. So those aren't even really apples to apples. Um, uh, when you're comparing the efficacy of some of these programs. So it's important to um, uh, decouple kind of a, a policy that like fits in a certain category and like is always bad um, and, and sort of be like, okay, there, there's actually a spectrum within each of these things, whether it's land use or it's rent control or whatever, and kind of helping people understand that, that um, this XYZ policy falls along a spectrum and why um, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, can maybe help rather than trying to say rent control is good and taking a farm stance on that or vice versa. Uh, that helps. Um, uh, the other thing uh, I think to your to the early part of your question um, is, uh, you know, um, there is a, uh, people see the imminent, imminency of, um, of new development um, in their community and there's false um, uh, sort of uh, correlations with other things that are going on in their community at the same time. So I might see a you know development, a multifamily development go up um, across the street maybe in a bike lane, um, and uh, and it's happening at the same time that my commute is lengthening, right? Um, so 
but it's not actually the case that that is necessarily impacting, it might be impacting your parking, but it's not impacting your commute, that densification is, is having an ameliorative effect um, on um, the really intense inter-community commute that actually messes up your day-to-day -day life. Um, so uh, uh, helping folks understand that these local solutions uh, when it comes to housing um, are, um, you know, uh, uh, not the cause of the of regional um, issues that impact your day-to-day -day, um, life. It is a um, uh, relatively nuanced re response to an overall regional issue that's seeking to, um, to address it. Um, so I know that was probably a little too, I don't know, intellectual to actually pull off with uh with with specific um uh stakeholders or folks but but um but creating a message messaging based on that this is the answer or this is a solution to a larger problem what you think is the problem is actually the solution um and why and why not doing anything will damage your day-to-day -day life is really i think an important thing um to to distinguish um uh there's also um uh, and, you know, just from organizing, uh, from the background of organizing, you just pick whatever people are most interested in. So if it's environmental, then you make an environmental argument. If it's um, education, schools, um, especially low-income communities are losing or hemorrhaging students because of the lack of um, ability to um, house students and teachers nearby. So um, you have to listen first to what the priorities of your, of your audience are, again, whether it's um, community members or um, or, or policymakers, and then speak in uh, in those terms while dispelling misconceptions at the same time. That's my best best stab. Great. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, uh, Brian, I'm going to uh, go back to you for just a second. Um, and, and Jonathan, you can chime in on this as well. But you know, you, you touched on this with the kind of the uh, push pull that we're seeing in this legislative session, where we've got a host of bills that are expanding local control and then we've got uh, 213 that's going to drastically reduce local control um it, 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 can you talk a little bit about that in terms of you know are there times where it's actually preferable to have local control versus uh, a state kind of policy um yeah that that's an interesting question joe um especially kind of in the in the context that we find ourselves i don't know if there's sort of a, a right or wrong answer to local control i think um i think what's important is understanding local housing needs in in and, and as jonathan said understanding those local needs and in, in perhaps a wider wider regional context and make Um, necessarily what's politically expedient. Um, you know, as we as we talk and focus, um, you know, and our focus as Housing Colorado is really on housing for low to moderate income individuals and families. Um, often the those families um, and, and those individuals have less power um, and they, there's a perception around who they might be. Um, it's a lot easier to talk about like the teacher, the nurse, the firefighter, who all are having housing issues as well than it is to talk necessarily about the custodian, the uh, grocery store worker, um, you know, folks making um, less income um, and, and, and are, who might be further down on the AMI charts um, that we use. Um, I think for us, you know, as we think about local issues, understanding um, understanding those needs and responding to those needs on a local level um, is is very important. Um, that's one of the interesting things, and and I'm I, I'll try and Housing Colorado hasn't taken a position yet on two thirteen on on the. Um, land use reform. But one of the interesting things that I've found um, reading it is um, the, the first part of the bill is, is really trying to put um, a finger on um, not only the, the housing needs of the state, but um, those regional and those local needs. And so and, and creating housing plans um, that are in response to that data. 
Um, you know, we've seen in, in some communities, um, you know, the, the housing needs assessments that they've completed say um, that they need housing um, at the lower income spectrum, but the, um, the desires of local elected officials is to actually meet um, those middle income housing needs um, more directly. And, you know, there's sort of this mismatch then of, um, you know, where perhaps public funds go, um, where energy is directed. And, um, you know, it's, it's important, I think, you know, the push pull then of um, local control versus um, state preemption kind of comes into play in those conversations of asking the question, you know, what is, what are the actual needs in your community? What plan do you have in place to meet those needs? And how can we direct state resources um, into those communities? Because we've, we've had a little bit of a blind spot, I think. Um, not that Chaffa and the Division of Housing haven't, um, you know, done their homework a lot of times, but, um, but we haven't had this comprehensive data set um, and, and perhaps even um, uniform data set and, and uniform way of addressing housing needs and communities. Um, you know, we've, we've taken a guess at what our shortage is. We've taken a guess at um, where resources should be directed. Um, and, and I think everybody's doing their best to, to, to meet those challenges. Um, but I think that, you know, that's kind of where that tension lies is like, what, how do we understand um, the local needs of a community? And then how do we, um, how do we best meet those needs with finite resources, finite um, energy and, 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 uh, and, the, and the like. So I don't, I don't know if that gets at your question, Joe, a little bit, but that's kind of what I think about in that tension, um, you know, between local control and, and state intervention. Yeah, no, I, and I know that, uh, well, Jonathan, did you have something you wanted to add there? Um, I was gonna say something small to that and then uh, speak to the uh, Prop 123 question. Um, is that what you wanted me to do or us to do? Okay. Go ahead and say what you were going to say, and then. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I was just going to. I was just going to um, ask whether either of you have heard from elected officials. I was looking at our participant list. I didn't see any, but uh, maybe there are elected officials in our group. Um, but uh, kind of a push pull with them as well that sometimes it's easier for the state to just say what needs to happen because it's it's more difficult for the local um, council member or mayor. Um, to resist when they've got a, a, a local or a vocal uh, constituency in their in their community that does not want um, development to occur, and so sometimes, sometimes taking this out. So I'm just curious whether or not you've heard from uh, elected officials whether or not they sometimes view um, the removal of local control favorably. Just out of curiosity, I guess I would say that um. um so uh, um, uh, so local local control um, versus regional control um, or state control, I guess, is is counterproductive when um, uh, when issues are regional, but solutions are are local. And then um, uh, local control is preferable where um, issues, local issues are nuanced um, and state issues are too, you know, um, uh, unnuanced or just monolithic. Um, and so uh, that's kind of where, where you decide whether it's a local or a, or a regional um, solution, I think is kind of the decision-making process um, there. Um, tied to that is that um, uh, for some local governments, um, especially ones that are thinking a little bit more regionally and some cities fall into this category, um, but you're also seeing commissioners fall into this category, you know, county commissioners, they tend to be more open to um, uh, state level intervention because it almost provides cover for them to do what they think their community has needed to do this entire time. Um, some cities think in that way, especially if part of their issue is that other communities aren't coordinating with them, right? Um, and so, so it provides cover um, when coordination is, is, a, is the issue and for any jurisdiction where that's the problem, you're seeing um, a lot more support to the point where there's a number of commissioners that actually spoke 
at the press conference uh, publicly and favorably in support of the land use reform. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but Brian. Yeah, great. No, no, I appreciate that. Um, we did have a question from Cecilia. Um, Cecilia, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Okay. Maybe uh, she's unable to do that. So she had a question that was in the chat. Um, uh, looking at folks with, uh, that are living on a lim limited income tend to be seniors. Um, the, the majority uh, in her in her chat, she's saying the majority is 30% AMI. Is there development that will be able to accommodate um, that percentage of our of our system um, in serving the 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 uh, again fixed income senior population? Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I I I think um, there are programs and. Um, opportunities out there to um, meet the needs of, of a lot of fixed income folks, including seniors and, and those uh, with disabilities. Um, you know, we've seen um, plenty of examples of, uh, you know, those folks not being able to find housing and then ending up experiencing homelessness um, in, in recent times. There's been some efforts um, to, to help, you know, especially like senior homeowners, um, you know, with property with the homestead exemption um, and reforming that a little bit so that seniors can downsize um, and, and still enjoy the property tax relief that comes with that. Um, there are uh, organizations dedicated to developing housing um, for low income and fixed income seniors. So there's, there is a lot um, going on out there. I think, you know, seniors are a part of um, a lot of the conversations I'm having um, as it as it pertains to the development of projects and you know folks within our our orbit at housing Colorado who um, really work in that domain. Yeah, great. Thank you. I would I would just say that um, uh, if you uh, have identified um, mm -hmm. uh, senior housing as a as a as a big need in uh, your community, um, then um, uh, just sending out requests for proposals or. Uh, for qualifications for um, nonprofits who can deliver on that type of housing is the best way of getting that type of housing um, in, in your community. And as Brian said, there's a ton that are experts at, at doing senior housing. Um, uh, um, and then uh, and then I think Brian already covered it with with uh, with tax and land value spiking and what that does to people who do already have homes, but maybe are feeling more and more pressured. So uh, yeah, that's what I'd say. Uh, find someone to build it. And, and 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 create a and 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 help create a path through um, sort of like uh, entitlements and um, and funding and other supports to um, to to make it uh, be easy dedicated land anything you can do to help them help you help address your issue is going to actually um, make it work. Great, thank you, um, Sue. You had a question about uh, Prop One Twenty Three. You want to unmute and. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of um, a lot of analyzing going on to try to figure out how to get true baselines for Prop One Two Three, and a problem for most of us is that we've really clearly tracked our restricted affordable, but that naturally occurring is is really hard to predict, and maybe inflated in some of the initial estimates. So, what are you guys thinking about that? Baseline is a is is a is sort of a fascinating process right now. Just a, a context. Um, there are um, there are some communities that um, uh, you know don't have very much um, uh, whether because of their size or just past history subsidized affordable housing, um, and um, and so they want to be able to. Uh, but maybe they've created something recently or a couple units recently, and they they don't. Think that they have room to continue building at that rate. It's all sorts of reasons, but there's an there's a uh, a desire to count naturally occurring affordable housing and the increase in that towards their three percent increase year over year. Um, then there's other communities that um, have a lot of naturally occurring affordable housing that they can't really control the increase of. And if you hold them to that standard, then it ends up being really really crazy. So a good example would be um, Boulder. Um, uh, the, the standards, including naturally occurring uh, affordable housing for Boulder, means I 
I think the baseline standard is something like 170 to 200 uh, units a year, something like that is what they would have to do to do that 3% increase. An identically sized city, um, Pueblo, um, because of all the naturally occurring affordable housing, would have to produce something like 700 units a year to do a 3% increase. Who has the worst affordable housing problem <laughs> between those two communities? Um, so the way that Prop 123 is supposed to work, and, and, and um, still figuring this out, I don't know, if Brian, you have more um, facts on this, but is that that baseline level is negotiated. So you, you, you that's baseline, and then the communities can go back and say, this is what we actually think we can commit to, and then that gets approved or disapproved um, by DOLA. It's disconcerting that the baselines are sometimes so out of whack and have some pretty big equity issues, like especially in that, I think that example, um, but it is not, in my understanding, static. So everyone will have an opportunity to negotiate that. Is that your understanding, Brian? Yeah, um, it is. You know, the the baseline, I think, perhaps is the hardest thing about um, Prop 123 is, you know, really establishing what's the starting point, like what's the starting line for everyone um, in terms of the 3% growth commitment that is required to um, access 123 funds. And, you know, I'll give it to Connor Everson over at the Division of Housing, like he's He's done an incredible job to to try and put some things together as a, as a starting point in the conversation. And, and I guess I would I would say and encourage um, you know city officials, municipality officials that you know really see this as as a as a conversation starter, not as a hard and fast um, a hard and fast kind of uh, requirement. Um, I guess, you know, there's a lot of ways to sort of wrap your head around um, what your baseline is. And and if, as long as you go in with kind of a comprehensive understanding and, and, and I think the data to back it up, you know, the Division of Housing is going to be willing to listen to you. Um, and DOLA is going to be willing to listen to you in terms of what you're, what you're trying to say is your starting point. So I don't have a lot of great advice. Um, I just... I know a lot of work is going into this right now. Um, and, and I also know that there's a lot of um, stress in, in local communities about this. So um, I guess just a word of encouragement, like, you know, this is a conversation um, and uh, a dialogue that, that local communities can be having with the Division of Housing. And just one more note on that is that um, the, um... Uh, yeah, uh, also hard time coming up with advice, but if I had to, um, you know, uh, make make your negotiation with the state about what you have control over. Um, so, um, you know, make those three percent increase standards as you know obviously controllable as possible, and make that case for why what you do and don't have control over, so that you can um, you can feel confident that you can hit that three percent. And I'll also know in the back of your mind that it's not actually a 3% mandatory per year, it's 9% um, overall over three years. So you don't have to do however many units each time. You can even put all your eggs in just a couple of baskets towards the end of that, of that period. Uh, and then if you don't make it, the penalty is just that you're not eligible for those funds um, until you create a new plan that tries to get you there. So it's not like anyone's going to get really slapped over the wrist on this. Well, if you get slapped over the wrist, but you won't get knocked over the head. That makes sense. Great. Well, and so I've got uh, another question that, um, it, you know, maybe hopefully something that um, is resonating with other folks in the, in the audience here. But, uh, you know, we do, we develop a lot of housing policies to help alleviate uh, pockets of poverty, you know, addressing infrastructure and other needs that are within disproportionately impacted communities. Um, but it, it, it seems there's a fine line between, um, you know, that reinvestment into uh, into these areas of our of our state and within our communities, where it, it starts to look like gentrification um, that essentially makes it so that the folks that are living in those neighborhoods can no longer afford to live in those neighborhoods. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you, if the two of you can maybe talk about, uh, you know, policies that, that have 
had the unintended consequence of of creating that kind of dynamic or maybe you can share examples of uh, uh, policies that have actually been able to walk that fine line and maybe if you if you have any examples that would be great well i'll just uh, maybe i'll i'll start without a specific policy in mind but um kind of reference back to uh, Senate Bill 213, the land use reform, um, part of the housing needs planning that has to be done is to um, look at displacement and, you know, they don't, they don't use the words gentrification, I, I don't think in the bill, but, um, you know, talking about displacement. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we've uh, been advocating for is, um, at the very least, a, a no net loss of affordable housing. Um, with the creation of new housing in, say, transit-oriented corridors that we know um, historically um, marginalized communities have felt have borne the brunt of development in those areas, um, that they have been historically displaced um, when housing comes in um, to transit corridors, um, especially into um, you know, transit stops like uh, light rail and 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 such. Um, so, you know, we've been looking at, and and Jonathan um, can speak probably more eloquent than eloquently than I can about um, you know what have other places done as they've been thinking about land use policy and anti displacement. Um, I'm heartened to see that that the governor has included. This um, com this part of the conversation in in this bill that that they're um, not simply thinking about housing just for housing's sake, but thinking about the communities that get affected when um, when new development goes into their communities. Jonathan's done some fascinating research, um, has some very pretty charts about um, what happens to um, rent in proximity to new development. Um, and, you know, there are um, communities who have been thinking about this, I think, longer than we have, um, and, and there's some lessons that we can learn from them. Yeah, it's, um, uh, and it's not always, um, yeah, it's really important to look at those other communities, and it's really difficult when things aren't apples to apples. So it's it's very, very, very uh, complex. Um, uh, quick um, explanation of the dynamic that Brian was just referencing from that research we were doing is um, when you create, um, when you allow new development, um, whether it's through infrastructure or zoning um, increases um, in a uh, in any given community, especially near a low income one. There's uh, essentially four dynamics that are going on, more or less, um, or, or lenses to look at it through. There's um, a local, um, uh, local short term, then local long term, and then regional short term and regional long term. And um, uh, how you judge um, what any given policy is, you know, going to be positive or negative for your housing um, needs. Um, depends partially on 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 that that those different uh, overlapping sort of lenses um in a nutshell um uh increasing housing supply um has pretty um positive um uh long term both regional and um local um impacts although it varies a little bit um and then at, but then um at the local level within about 300 meters of any new development, what ends up happening is that your um, the rents for uh, so a market rate unit comes in, rents for other market rate units within 300 meters um, go down um, because they're competing. Rents for lower income units within that same area go up, and then the further away you are from that new development, the less of an impact it has on either high end or low end um, units over time. Um, of course. If you just have a bunch of those new developments everywhere, then then it becomes close to everything, and you have this overall um, this this overall um, you know sort of displacement effect. Um, and so that means that you need to have a policy that increases housing supply because it will um, uh, you know re 
reduce demand or at least address demand and create, create a rebalance of that over time. But you have to have uh, programs that neighborhood by neighborhood, new development, new development have a, uh, um, an ability to mitigate that displacement effect um, on lower income units. Policies that do that include um, tax um, mitigation. You know, um, folks are probably familiar with the Park Hill development in Denver. The developer there has proposed to offset um, the increase in um, taxes um, uh, in uh, single family, you know, homeowner homes within a certain radius who are below a certain income for like five or six years. And not every developer is gonna have the luxury to do that. Not every community will, will maybe have the funds to offset that, but that's kind of an example of how to think about it. They're increasing housing. It's a need, there's a percentage that's affordable, and yet they're gonna make sure that folks who are low income in the area do not have taxes that rise, rise in, um, because of that. Another other types of programs or preference pro policies where new development sets aside a certain percentage of its units to serve the local, um, like local residents within a certain radius. So it's not just people at higher income ranges coming in um, into the community. Um, and, uh, and potentially it's an opportunity for folks who are feeling squeezed within that community to move into a, um, a more affordable unit. And you can firmly market the, those units and hold them aside for a certain period of time. And Denver is working on a policy essentially like that or has essentially a policy like that. Um, not enough time to go into uh, more, but happy to talk with folks further if they um, later if uh, you're interested in, in anti-displacement policies for your community. It really varies and there's a lot of communities here. So it's hard to give anyone prescription. Yeah, no, that's great, Jonathan. Um, is there a chance that uh, that, uh, that study that you, that Brian kind of set you up for, um, is there a way that that can be shared with our uh, with our group? Yes. I, I again don't want to uh, don't want to put you on that that spot if there's uh, some sensitivity to it. But uh, uh, again, uh, it sounds like it would be very valuable to to benefit from that research that you've been working on this with. Yeah. No, yeah. No problem. Happy share. Terrific. Terrific. Thanks so much. So for those of you who are are uh, dialing in. Um, what we've got the, the screen up here real quick. Um, I'm just going to point out that everyone at, after uh, this session is over next week, you'll be getting a, a link that will take you back to our NOCO housing website. And so we'll have a recording of this presentation. And then again, you'll be able to see previous pre presentations as well. So feel free to uh, peruse that. Um, and then when uh, we're, we have access to the report that Jonathan put together, That'll show up in this library as well. Um, and then again, we've got contact information for both Brian and, and Jonathan. They've been very generous with their time and uh, obviously have been very busy over the last couple of months with everything going on at the Capitol. So appreciate you taking the time to join with us today. And, and uh, again, thank you so much for, for your time and expertise. And uh, for those of you who would like to follow up with Jonathan or Brian, the, there's the email address. So feel free to reach out to them directly. And uh, with that, I will also, once again, thank our sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber. And I think there's somebody else in there. And Credit Union, New Colony Apartments, Northern Engineering, Somerset Apartments, and UC Health. Um, all make these uh, these presentations possible. So again, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your time today. And thank you all for joining us. And uh, keep um, uh, track of the emails. We'll be announcing our next uh, quarterly event uh, in June, I believe it is. And we'll have uh, that topic sent out to all of you in advance. So if you want to join us uh, in the future, uh, your name is already on our list. So we'll, we'll be getting that information out to you. And with that, Brian, Jonathan, any final words? You know, just to appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, if you have any needs, feel free to reach out to me. I'm really happy to continue the conversation. Same, same, same. Great, great to chat with you all today. Thank you, Jonathan. And, and uh, with everyone else, have a great weekend. Thanks for joining.